saw who the man was, and I'm sure Michael would know who he is immediately. The early church was trying to help him plead his case to keep him from being martyred. He asked them not to. He said, I would like to become a martyr for the Lord, but I don't know that I'm worthy. When I hear things like that, I just say, Lord, stir my heart to love you more. Lord, let you become my focus. Let you become more to me than life, Lord. Let you become all to me, Jesus. Stir our hearts, Lord. Stir our hearts to want you more than we want jobs and things and position and all the things that we've attached to ourselves, Lord, in the Western church. Oh, Lord, let the fire of love burn in our hearts. God, that we're willing to give you all because we want to. <laughs> Not because we have to, but because you're more. You're more than life. I love you, Jesus. Just lift your hands again and love on him. Come on, just love on Jesus. Just love him. Speak your words of love to the Lord. I challenge you right now to step outside of all the church stuff you know and all the words that you know to say and all the glories and hallelujahs and all that sort of thing and just get real intimate with him. Begin to tell him from your heart what you really feel about him. His spirit is hovering in this place. Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. Yes, Lord. And I your heart to one. Sing one more time. I love you. Sing it to Jesus. I love you because you first loved me. Because you first loved me. And That's us.
Can't you just feel it physically when the Spirit of the Lord is pleased? I think if our spiritual eyes were open right now, we'd see the Lord in this place smiling and enjoying all this craziness. <laughs> oh, yes, Lord. You are good. Lord, help me say to the Lord, you are good. <laughs> Sing it to the Lord, you are good. You are good. to be your friend, oh God, how sweet to be your friend, oh God, we long to be your friend, oh God, how sweet to be your friend, oh God. So good, Lord. It's so good, Lord. So good, Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> His presence is here tonight. Amen. Wow. Listen, a while ago when we were worshiping the Lord, I just, I just felt that. Um, 
There's some of you here, you thought, you, you've come to this revival and you thought, you know, if I just had a worship leader, I could have revival at my church. But let me tell you something, it's not, uh, revival is not about good worship. It's not about having a personality behind a pulpit. Right. Lynn will tell you, before this revival hit, God was good to him, but he didn't have revival everywhere he went. No. Steve didn't have revival everywhere he went. Let me tell you what's making the difference is the glory of the Lord and the anointing of the is in this place. It's the glory of the Lord that's in this place. Let me tell you, we don't understand everything that's going on in this place, but there's a couple of things. Just remain standing just for a minute. I just feel, I just feel so strong that I need to share this. You know, we come here and we say, God, we want revival, but you know, I don't think a lot of us understand what we want. You know, we don't fully understand what revival is. But you know, when God shows up, and I know Mike probably talked, you talked today about what revival is and what isn't. How many of you were here for Mike's session this afternoon? I know it was incredible. I didn't make it, but I know it was incredible. How many of you men have ever made this, how many of you men have ever made this embarrassing mistake? You put on maybe navy blue britches, and you thought you had navy blue socks on? You know, inside the, inside the house in that artificial light, those socks, when you pull them out of the drawer, in that artificial light, they look blue, didn't they? But you put them on and you go outside in the true sunlight and you look down and you go, my lands, look what I did. You know what? I believe the church has been without some, the, the radiant light of Jesus Christ for so long that some of the things that we thought were such and such a way, you know, Saul, on his way to Damascus, he thought he was right. Yeah, he, sure he thought he was right. He, he, he would have staked his life on the fact that he was right. He was standing for righteousness. But you know what? When the true light of Jesus Christ struck him down, it opened his eyes. And he said, you know what? What I thought was blue really wasn't blue. It was black. And some of the things that we think are God, we think are are right, you know, when God begins to shine down, his glory begins to enter the house, all of a sudden we realize that we didn't think, we didn't have everything together like we thought we did. God can get your attention. And he has done that many times. In fact, let me show you. I love this story. In youth service one night, I had three knotheads came into my youth service. These three, these three kids, they, they did not even believe in God. Did not even believe in God, but some of my young people kept begging them to come. It was two young men and a young lady, and they, they sat all the way through our worship, through the preaching, through the altar call, and we prayed for the young people at the end of the service like we do over here in the revival service. And these three young people were sitting in my right, the third pew, and as we were praying for young people at the end, and they were being slain in the Spirit, and some of them would shake violently under the power of the Holy Spirit, these three kids that came there did not believe in God, were sitting there making fun of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Making fun of the Holy Ghost, okay? We were into that for about 40 minutes, and finally the young lady comes running up to me. She didn't even know who I was. She just knew I was supposed to be in charge. She comes right up to me, Mr., Mr., and she's bawling uncontrollably, uncontrollably. She said, Mr., 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 you're not going to believe what just happened. I said, what happened? She said, you're just not going to believe it. I said, what happened? You're just not going to believe it. I said, would you just calm down? What happened? She said, my, my two friends and I, we didn't even believe in God. Now, one of these guys came in on crutches. He fell off the back of the truck going down the highway just a couple of days before. Came in on crutches, messed his knee up big time. She said, but we're over there making fun of you guys. We're making fun, and God healed his knee. <laughs> I went over there, there's a 19-year-old young man who just five minutes earlier had the world by the tail. You know the kind I'm talking about? Cocky as all get out. He just knew he was hot stuff. But you know what? God got a hold of his tent. I went over there and he's, his face is red, his shirt's soaking wet. He's squalling uncontrollably. I said, what happened, man? <laughs> he starts running up and down the stairs. Needless to say, they, they believed in Jesus Christ that night. 
When the glory of the Lord showed, shines, uh, shows up, the, the true light shines through, and you begin to see things more clearly. I'll tell you something else that's happening as the glory of the Lord's coming back. Thank God the authority and the power of Jesus Christ is being returned to the church, too. You know, the world, we have been a mockery of the world for way too long. But the reason is, is because there's been no authority and no power in the church. How many of you have ever been traveling down the interstate? You pop over a hill and all of a sudden you see an unusual looking car with something on top of it. And then all of a sudden what happens? You start traveling differently. Why is that? Did the speed limit change? No, I'll tell you the reason why. Because all of a sudden within view there was, there was authority. See, there's been no authority in the church. Young people can come to the church and goof off and, and mock the church because there's no authority there. There's no power. But all of a sudden, if you let a power and authority show up in the building, all of a sudden, respect and the fear of God is restored once again. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. And it's time. It is past time. For such things to happen in the church. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me share with you one other thing, though. I'll tell you what, God is just, you know, I love this revival. But more than this revival, I love Jesus. This revival has burned such a fresh love in my heart for him. And I love this word. This morning, I, I had to get some work done on my car. And at Big Ten, I sat in Big Ten this morning, this morning for two hours. And all I could do was just read and just love on Jesus. But, but you know, the Lord showed me something else. This morning, and this is for somebody here. In fact, it's for several of you here. The scriptures in Jonas, verse 8 of chapter 2 says this. Those who cling to worthless idols. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. There's a lot of people in the church too now. Listen to me, saints. A lot of people in the church that they're forfeiting the grace and the presence of God because they want to cling to some idols. They say, Steve talks about it all the time, wheeling and dealing with God. Listen to me. You want the glory of God on your life? You want the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life? You want the grace and the blessing of the Lord on your life? You've got to give up those idols. You've got to give them up. You know, we, we scream for revival, but you know, church, when I read the New Testament, I read the Gospels, everywhere Jesus showed up, two things always happened, and they always happen. When Jesus showed up, there was revival and riots at the same time. Amen. Always. Revival can be an ugly and a painful experience. It will be a painful experience. There's been, there's been things that the Lord has showed me about myself that I hate. I hate it, and I had to deal with it. Never even knew it was there before. So let's cry for revival. But I'm telling you, church, there's a price. There's a price. It is well worth the price. Can you say amen? Give the Lord praise this evening. Lord, send this revival. Sweep across this land, Lord. Sweep across this land, Lord. Sweet Jesus. Let it be, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated this evening. Woo. Tonight's a good night. I want to encourage you. How many of you are here for the very first time in our revival? Very first time. Bless the Lord. That's tremendous. God bless you. Amen. Welcome them tonight. If you're here for the very first time, I want to encourage you. Be obedient to the Lord tonight as he speaks to you. Be obedient tonight. Obedience is very key to receiving from the Lord. Be obedient. And I want to encourage you to remain. With, boy, tonight would be a good night to be prayed for. The presence of the Lord is so sweet in this place. Amen. So be sure to remain and let us pray for you tonight as well. Our ushers are going to come, and they're going to give you an opportunity to worship the Lord this evening with an offering. Can you give the Lord praise? Hallelujah.
Amen. Which the order and first taught about what revival is not, what revival is. We on? Is that all right? Can you hear me? Now you need to listen to this. Make it plain. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to explain that right now. But uh, I just want to ask something of the people here. How many of you, since you've been in these meetings, I don't care if you got saved here, if you come here as a serious believer, as a backslider, but how many of you have really experienced deep conviction of sin since you've been in these meetings? Would you raise your hands? And put your hands down. How many that have been here for more than one night, been here for a number of services, have heard more warnings and more preaching of judgment and the wrath of God than you're used to hearing for years? Would you raise your hands? Put your hands down. How many of you have experienced a fresh love for Jesus being in the meetings? How many of you have felt guilt leave and a sense of pardon and greater love and adoration for the Lord? Would you raise your hands? I'm doing that for a reason. You know, we don't... We don't advertise these meetings. We don't try and get people in. The question is what to do with the crowds, larger facilities, all that is necessary. And we know that anything God does is always going to be opposed and it's always going to be misunderstood. And Jesus himself was a sign spoken against. And it's been said that if a revival is not spoken against, you better check again to be sure that it's a revival. So there are always going to be critics. And Jesus said about the critics, leave them alone. They're blind guides. But Jesus did expose them, and our concern is always for the people that can be misled or hurt. It's not to try and prove anything. God is not waiting for Steve Hill or any of us to get up and defend him. God is not rejoicing if we give him our nod of approval. But it helps sometimes to understand what's going on out there so that you can keep moving forward and not get slowed down and not get stopped. I was having a little fun today, and I'm just going to take a minute here, but I was having a little fun. And you have to forgive me, but I gave away some of the trade secrets today, brothers. I told it. You were here. You heard it. I, I'm an honest guy. I just, sometimes I say, say things I shouldn't. You know, we're all in this for the money, of course. That's why we do this. If you're a critic, I just want that to be known. And one of the best, and pastors, not, if you weren't here today, mark this down. One of the best money-making things you can start in the church is one of those prayer tables, because we charge based on the size of the picture, based on if it's oil, if it's... That's why you don't see very many big things there because it's too expensive to put on the prayer table. Now, I, I was just really honest today. And, you know, sometimes we're praying for people and we're coming through quickly and I can be big and lean over and you realize, boy, you may be leaning on someone and obviously the goal is not to push people over. We don't have people coming around the world so that we can push them over. You know, you could stay home in your bedroom and have your husband or wife just push you over, you know? <laughs> But, you know, I, I, we all try to be as careful as we can, you know, and sometimes I'll be praying and you start to fall forward and you may put, touch someone's head like that, so I immediately, I just have one hand behind their head. And, and this way, if they're starting to fall, I'm actually trying to hold them up. And if my hand is behind their head, they can't accuse me of pushing. Well, I became guilt-ridden today and I wanted to explain what I really do. What I do is I pull the hair back like that. <laughs> Now, I, I, I was telling the truth today. I'm sorry. Someone on national radio recently accused Steve of using hypnotism, which is what... Now, he's been accused of that before, which means he's doing something right. What it really is is he's getting results and others aren't, and they can't figure out it's God, so they have to come up with some other idea. So... Now, Charles Parham, who was one of the pioneers of the Pentecostal movement at the beginning of the century, when God started using William Seymour, who had heard stuff about the Holy Spirit from Parham, when God started using Seymour, Parham went to Azusa Street and blasted it, blasted it, said it's mesmerism, it's hypnotism, it's a shameless imitation of Pentecost. That's what he said. This was an early Pentecostal leader, missed the fullness of the Pentecostal move as it began to explode. It happened. But I have to confess about the hypnotism charge. Did you ever see some of the people on the prayer team and they come to you with a few fingers? They're trying to hypnotize you. That's why they use the fingers. That's the way we train them, with the fingers. And 
I, you got to forgive me for this one, really. I'm sorry. Richard, all of you, please. But you know why the ushers follow us around as we pray for the people? To pull the money out of the pockets once they fall. That's why we do it. I have to be honest. I'm, I confessed all of this today, for all of it. If the cat's out of the bag. You know it's God moving when in the end of a session like that, people are on their faces weeping and wailing. You know that the spirit moved anyway. <laughs> but listen, I have realized something about blindness. I'm, I'm starting a book now, Let No One Deceive You, Confronting the Critics of Revival. And I'm going to write a chapter called Blind Guides or Guides for the Blind. Because many of the people that think they're setting things right are actually the ones who are blind. And there are two aspects of blindness I've been thinking about. The one kind of blindness doesn't see what's really happening because it gets distracted by other things. We said the other night someone getting baptized begins to shake and they're sharing how they've been set free from 20 years of drug addiction. And the person who's spiritually blind doesn't hear the testimony, doesn't see the glory of God. All they see is the shaking. But there's another type of blindness where if a person is blind, they can be in the room with John Kilpatrick, but they don't know he's there because they don't see him, even though he's right there. They can come into his study and look for him, but because they can't see, they don't see him. Jesus says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And you know what the Pharisees say? They're in the presence of the light of the world. Your testimony is not true because you're testifying about yourself and according to the law a man cannot be a witness of himself that legalism blinded them so in the presence of the light they didn't see a friend of mine last night sent me a, a note that he had seen apparently from the Pensacola News Journal it was on the internet from a local Baptist pastor now thank God God's pouring out a spirit among Baptists there are outpourings for the last couple of years on Baptist colleges and Baptist churches there are dead Pentecostal churches and alive Baptist churches, and there are dead Baptist churches and alive Pentecostal churches across the board. God's moving in some places, and other places it hasn't broken through yet. But this is what this man says. Now, <clears throat> would, you, would you like me to do this, Steve? Why not? Why not? All right, I've, I've never done this. There's only one problem. There's only one problem. How do you hold the piece of paper with the mic and the, the stick? You help me? You want the mic or the paper? I have been praying for years for another great awakening, so I attended services at Brownsville Assembly, hoping that these prayers have been granted. The Brownsville experience is not a true revival of God, maybe a revival of Pentecostalism, but not of God's Spirit. True revival springs forth from the plain presentation of truth producing great conviction of sin. The lasting effects of revival are unmistakable. God-pleasing behavior out of gratitude from a pardoned rebel. Although emotional expression has abounded during true revivals, it was because sinners were fearful of God's wrath. The focus was not upon some experience or even on the Holy Spirit, whose purpose is to spotlight the person of Christ rather than draw attention to himself. The Brownsville meetings are an open display <laughs> and promotion of the charismatic phenomenon referred to as being slain in the spirit. Say that again. The Brownsville meetings are an open display and promotion of the charismatic phenomenon referred to as being slain in the spirit. I am saddened 
that this entertainment factor is drawing curiosity seekers better than a Garth Brooks concert. <laughs> need to start preaching the Bible, not their experiences. Listen to me. I know where I'm going. In his sovereign timing, God will send true revival, but it will be unmistakably focused on Christ and his atoning work rather than sensationalism. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Signed, yours truly, Pastor, and for mercy's sake, we don't give his name. Listen, I, I can't do it the same, but at least I try. Just listen. Hear me. I better put my glasses on or I won't need that. <laughs> Hear me really seriously. You wonder how someone could come to meetings which are known for simple presentation of the truth how many of you were here last week with the period exclamation point question mark message? One of the simplest, clearest, most anointed presentations of who Jesus is you'll ever hear. When you talk about where's the conviction of sin and where are the warnings of the earth, everything that he's looking for are the hallmarks of what God is doing here. And you know why that's scary? Because pride can blind any of us. And for years, I asked myself the question, how do you know, this is what I asked myself, how do you know that the next great move God brings, you won't be the one denouncing it? How do you know you won't be the one on the wrong side of the fence? How do you know you won't become the religious traditionalist? There's only one way, you stay on your face. You stay on your face and say, God, I don't know a whole lot, but you've got to move. And God, you use whoever you want to use. If there's competition in me, if there's pride in me, if you want to start it down the block for me, if you want to start it at this other church, this other group, this other denomination, you do what you want to do. And you bow down and you get in the river, friends. God's moving across the land, across denominational barriers, across every type of barrier you can imagine. The Holy Spirit is moving. The potential for this hour is awesome. So I encourage you, my brother, my sister, dive into God without reserve. Seek his face like you never have before. Determine to pray and cry out and fast and obey until the glory comes down. Because God wants to visit your city. God wants to visit your state. God wants to visit your community. God wants to visit your life. And according to the degree of hunger in you, he will fill you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? No, I'm not making copies of this letter available. <laughs> Close your eyes with me, Father. I pray for this man that wrote this letter. Yes. Open his eyes. <laughs> Lord, send the fire to his church. Yes. <laughs> Surprise him, Lord. Lord, have mercy on the critics. They don't know. They don't understand. Have mercy on them and send revival to them. Yes. Use them, O oh God, for your purposes and not against them. Thank you, Jesus. May each of us humble ourselves in your sight and receive your fullness. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to give you a short break now, about five minutes. are non-Pentecostal. You are not Pentecostal. Hold your hand up. Stand up if you're not Pentecostal. Stand up. Look at this. Look at this. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep, keep standing just for a moment. Let's just find out who some of you are. What, are, what denomination are you folks? Baptist? Non-denominational? You don't know what you are? That's good. Hey, that's fine. Back over here. Episcopal. All right. Yeah. 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 Over here. Christian reform. 
Back over here. Hold your applause. Baptist. You won't tell if you want. Uh, over here. Who? Yeah. Overseas, where are you guys from? Germany and Brazil. All right. I never heard of those denominations, but it sounds great. <laughs> uh, where y'all? What denomination y'all from? Episcopal. Episcopal. Wow, that's yeah. great. Well, listen. What do you Episcopalians think about this kind of stuff? It's kind of this. You like? This is some strange going ons. Do y'all have this kind of goings on at your church? Do you really? Wow, man, that's great. Uh, where y'all from? Non-denominational? That's wonderful. All right. Oh, let's see. How many of you tonight are uh, from, you can be seated. How many of you are from the Southeast United States? Hold your hand up. How, <laughs> all right, watch this now. How many of you are from outside the Southeast United States? Let me see your hand. Wow. Stand up. You're from outside the Southeast United States. Goodness. All right. How many of you are from the North? Wow. Where are you guys from? Huh? Michigan. Wisconsin. <laughs> Where are y'all from? Michigan. Did you come together on a bus? Great. Yeah. What denomination are you? All of the above. <laughs> okay. Uh, how many of you are from the Midwest? Let me see your hand. Wow. How many of you are from the West? God bless you, folks. All right, you can be seated. How many of you are from outside the United States of America? Stand up. Outside the United States. Look at this. Look at this. All over. All over. Let's find out where y'all are from. Where are you from? Scotland. I like, I like the way you said that. I want you to say that. Scotland. Scotland. All right. You know, brother, my name is Kilpatrick, and for years I thought I was Irish, but I'm Scottish. So what's your name? Mike Taylor. Mike Taylor. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you was Kilpatrick. <laughs> Kilpatrick. All right, where are you from? Canada. Germany. Finland. Yeah. All right. Back here in the back. Where are y'all from? Canada. All y'all from Canada Park. Ottawa. All right. Where are you from? Australia. Australia. All y'all from Australia? Okay. Indonesia. Indonesia. Wow, you're a long way from home. God bless you. It's good to have you all. What is your name? Susie? Joannis. Joannis, it's good to have you with us. What part of Indonesia are you from? From uh, Java Island, Samarang City. Wow. Have you ever heard of Klaus Kugler, a missionary over there? He's a great man of God. If you ever meet him, you'll love him. Good to have you all. Where are you from? Australia. I like the way you say that. Say that. Australia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, over here, Juan, who you got with you? Cuba. All right. Argentina and Cuba. All right. South America. Wow, it's great to have you. God bless you, honey. Balcony, Hallelujah. Pastor, right? Up in the balcony. Okay, where are you from, baby? Kuwait. 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 <laughs> wow. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you just for a moment. This is the first night that all of us have got up here and talk like this. Richard's talked for a while, and Mike's talked for a while, and so I said, well, you know, since I'm the pastor, I might ought to say a few words. <laughs> I want to encourage you, go after God. Go after God in revival. Because, friend, let me tell you, revival is the cure of all ills. If you're having church trouble, revival is the answer. If you're having stress and things are cold and dry and dead in your church, revival is the answer. 
Now, whenever you have revival, revival is like a lightning rod. It's going to draw a lot of different things. It's going to draw the Spirit of God, and it's going to draw souls, but it's also going to draw a lot of demonic activity. It's going to draw attack of the devil. So I want you to be prepared for that. But you know, Jesus said whenever he came to the earth, he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. And he's called the Prince of Peace, and he's lovely, and he's wonderful, and he's the spotless Son of God and the Lamb of God. But I tell you, sometime before the Lord can make things right, he has to divulge and reveal the wrong. And sometime before there can be peace in your church, the Lord will have to bring a sword in it. When revival broke out here at Brownsville on Father's Day of 1995, the Holy Spirit came in tremendous power. And we had three things that happened that I thought was really ironic. Um, there's three categories of people that you're going to have, well, actually four, whenever revival hits your church, pastors. How many pastors do we have here tonight? Hold up your hand. Yeah, wow, great. God bless you. When revival hit, go ahead. Welcome these pastors. Whenever, whenever revival hit on Father's Day, we had some DOAs. It killed them dead in the water right there, friend. They didn't want it. You see, once we had this new building dedicated, help me out a little bit, Benny, on that. It's ringing. Once we had um, the building dedicated here in 1991, we moved them across the street to here, and this building seats about three times as many as the chapel across the street. Well, uh, this building was dedicated on January the 13th, and two days later, the Gulf War broke out in Kuwait and uh, with Iraq. <clears throat> so the church filled up instantly. Well, the power of God began to move even then. And uh, you remember people were going to church. They were going and buying books, books on prophecy and bookstores. You remember all that? Well, this building filled up instantly. And we didn't lose anybody much at all. Matter of fact, the building stayed full from the first Sunday, January the 13th, uh, right on up. We, we went from like running uh, 9 to 1,100 to running up to 1,800 almost immediately. Well, in that number, there was a lot of people that had filtered in here and, and uh, found a perch and found a branch in this church to nest in, and uh, they didn't want to move of God. So by the time the Lord poured out His Spirit four years later, uh, they were from all different faiths and all different religious backgrounds, and a lot of them didn't want the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we would have good services. We'd have people filled with the Holy Spirit. We'd have times of refreshing, but the church wasn't in a constant state of revival like it is now. So as soon as revival hit, we had some DOAs. It just killed them right there. They never came back. Didn't want to come back. The second thing we had was some ICUs. <laughs> it didn't kill them, but they came close, friend. I'm telling you. God had to put them on oxygen. And, uh, you know, IVs and machines, all kind of machines. And it took us a while to nurse some of them back into revival. And uh, we got some. We lost some. We had some more casualties. You know, we, we lost some over a period of weeks. I don't want no part of that. But some of them, we nursed them back in here, and we got them back. And then we had some ERs. We had some scrapes and some bruises and some cuts and some stitches and a few things like that. And they were right back in next week or two. And then we had those that jumped in whole heart. So there's going to be that in any church. Whenever God begins to send his revival spirit to a church, you're going to have it. Pastors, be prepared. It's going to happen just like that no matter where you are because people are the same everywhere. And I just want to share a couple of things with you real quick before we change order of the service. Number one, there's a strange phenomenon that's happening today among the body of Christ. You see, in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation refers to the people of God in heaven as the bride. But on the earth, the Bible refers to the people of God on the earth as the body. I think what's happening right now in the body of Christ on the earth is there is, um, there is an, uh, a delineation taking place. There is a ascertaining taking place. While the bride of Christ is being ascertained from among the body, the bride of Christ is being called out from among the body. Because you see, there's a lot of people in the body that I'm not so sure is going to make up part of the bride. I want to say that again. There's a lot of people that's part of the body that I'm not so sure is going to make up part of the bride. Amen. Now, I want to give you two illustrations real quick from the Scriptures. I'm not going to take much time at all, but let me just give you two of these real quick. 
Jesus gave both of them. You remember he said in Matthew 25, he gave the illustration of the parable of the five wise and the five foolish what? Virgins. He didn't say there were five harlots and five virgins. He said they all were virgins. Number two, he said they all were asleep. They all were asleep. Number three, he said they all had lamps. They all had lamps. Number four, he said they all heard the voice of the bridegroom. And the voice of the bridegroom always shouts out. He sent ahead of the bridegroom, and he shouts out at the window of the bride, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So the bridegroom always sends the friend of the bridegroom ahead of him to prepare the bride to get ready to go out and meet the bridegroom. What I think is taking place, and I may be wrong, but because we're so close to the coming of the Lord, all the signs are ready, Israel, everything else, all of it's there. The stage is set for the soon coming of the Lord. I believe that the coming of the Lord is so close and God's pouring out His Spirit now like He is in unprecedented ways around the world, including here at Brownsville. I believe that God now among the body, the so-called people that call themselves the church on the earth, the so-called body on the earth, I believe God's calling out His church, His bride from among that body. Because the Bible said, at midnight a cry was made, prepare! In the first week of this revival, a message came in tongues, and we've had very few of that. You'd think in a revival like this, there'd be messages, every service in tongues, and interpretation, but there's been very, very little of that unusually. I would say no more than five or 10 in 370 services. Probably five or 10 messages in tongues. There's been some prophecies, but the first week of revival, when it broke out, a message came in tongues, and it said this. I am now introducing my son to you while you're still on the earth and I'm bringing you into intimacy with him so when you see him at the meeting in the air you won't be surprised who he is. That's what he said. And let me tell you, we've seen a lot of phenomena in this revival. We've seen people on the floor. We've seen people shake. I've been on the floor. I've shook. It doesn't change. It doesn't save you. Only the blood saves you. But God has truly brought thousands and thousands and thousands of pastors and parishioners into a closer relationship with Jesus. So the Bible said that the difference was that five had oil and five did not have oil. And while the five turned to the ones that did have oil, they said, give us of your oil. And the ones with the oil said, I'm sorry, you'll have to go get it where we got it. And the Bible says while they left to go away and get the oil, the door was closed. The bridegroom came, and he shut them out. Now, the second illustration I want to give you is real quick, too, and, and this is something that has always stirred my soul. Pastors, listen to me. Not everybody in your church that names the name of the Lord knows God. Not everybody on your board knows God, probably. And not every pastor behind pulpits knows God. We're in a strange time. This is a strange time. Pardon the expression, but there's a lot of bastard children out there that's never been part of the body of Christ. They sound right, they look religious, and they do all the right things and sound all the whistles and press all the buttons, but something's wrong. Pardon the expression, they're bastard children. Here's what the Lord said. He said, many will come unto me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And he said, I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. I never knew you. Now let me break that scripture down real quick, and here's what it says. Jesus said, Many will come unto me that day, saying, Lord, Lord. You know what the Bible says? No man calleth Jesus Lord, but what? By the Holy Ghost. It means, in other words, the Holy Ghost will show you who Jesus is, and when you really see him for who he is, not just a giver, but the Savior, and he brings you into union and relationship with him. You see, communion means common union. He brings you into common union with the Lord. When you see Jesus for who he is and the Holy Spirit introduces him to you and you see him, you're without excuse. So the Bible says, no man calleth Jesus Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. They knew him. They had a relationship with him. Second thing was, he said, they will say unto me, have we not cast out devils in thy name? It didn't say they tried to cast out devils or they attempted to cast out devils. He said they cast them out. 
The second thing he said about that was, have we not prophesied in thy name? didn't say they attempted to prophesy. He said they prophesied. And we've done many wonderful works. And he said, I will say unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Or the word there, iniquity, means lawlessness. You'd have no law over you. When it says, I never approved of you, or I never knew you, it means I never approved of you. You took the gift, you took the anointing, you went out and did a lot of things, but you never knew me. So I want to tell you, there's in the body of Christ today, I believe that God now is bringing a sword in the so-called body of Christ, and the true bride is being ascertained from among the body, and God's getting the bride ready to meet him in the air. And I don't know how many is going to make up that bride, but the only thing I'm concerned about is I want myself to make it. Amen. You see, I'm concerned about everybody else too, but I'm a lot concerned about myself because the Bible said the heart is deceptive and who can know it? Revival will reveal your own heart. And God will take a chisel and a hammer out and he'll begin to show you some things about your heart. A lot of areas that needs to be knocked off. So God bless you, folks. We love you. Thank you.
I have felt all day that the Lord, as a matter of fact, I'm going to re reconstruct this. I have felt since Halloween night that the Lord is not finished with something. And uh, I want everyone in this place, for the next few minutes, I want you to be honest. I want you to be straight with yourself. Don't lie to yourself. We are liars, friends. We lie to ourselves about the way we really are. And it's been hammered away tonight about what Pastor just shared, about there's people that will say, but Lord, I did this and I did that. Friend, to not be one of those people, you've got to deal with it now. To not be one of those people that Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You've got to deal with it now. This is when it's honesty, honesty time. This is when you deal with it. Could I be that person, Lord? Could I be that person that's doing everything in your name, but I don't have a clue who you are? I don't know you. And this is where you deal is right here, not on Judgment Day. You don't deal with that on Judgment Day. You deal with it right now. I want everyone tonight to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. I want you to bow your head, no one looking around. There's some people in this room that hate this revival. You don't want to be here. I know you're here. I've already seen you. You don't want to be here. Somebody drug you into this place. I'm telling you, sir. I'm telling you, ma'am. I'm telling you, son. I'm telling you, girl. You're in this place because God brought you in here. God's trying to get a hold of you. And if you get out, if you step out of this building before God's finished, you're going to be held accountable. You ain't slipping out, friend. You're going to be held accountable on Judgment Day. I want everyone right now to pray this prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Now, there's a few people that did not pray just then. I said I want everyone to pray. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now everyone is here, as we say each night, under divine appointment. By the way, that letter that Mike Brown read to you, what he didn't know is that was written uh, over a year ago. And I remember when the man wrote the letter, he was a Baptist pastor, I believe, when he wrote it, he was blasted so hard by, by people everywhere. Because here's what happens, friend. We don't, we don't stand up here and try to lift up this revival as far as, you know, either God's in it or he's not. Either there's an anointing or there's not. If there's not, let's all go play golf or do something else. But this is God. And if it's God and people are getting saved, then God's going to take care of himself. He's going to take care of it. And what I have found is, as, as we continue on, and pastors, you'll see this in the revival, as you continue on with your revival, God moves, people are getting saved. They, the people, the sheep themselves, the people will take care of a lot of the stuff out there. Because they go out in the highways and the byways. And I shared the illustration the other day. I met a plumber from a Baptist church that was against the revival until his mother was healed here. Okay? I never talked to him. Pastor never talked to him. Richard never talked to him. The newspapers never talked to him. His mama was healed of cancer here. And so God will take care of it. And so a lot of that, the person that wrote that letter, if you've read the Pensacola News Journal, you'll find that very little has been said negatively because over a million, 300,000 people have come here and the crime rate is down, the schools have been affected. What are you going to say? What do you say? What do you say to people like Patrick? And we keep picking on you, brother, because you're big enough to see in this place. What are you going to say about a guy that was a bouncer in a bar, a drug dealer, that's been saved in this revival, now he wants to go into ministry. How do you go against that? Right there, wave at us. But one of the reasons we mentioned this criticism part of it, and we will we'll continue doing the white cane religion illustration, for those of you that haven't seen it, Mike illustrated it tonight. There's a lot of people that think they know where they're going and they're blind as can be. And the reason we share that, friend, is because I want you to make up your mind. Do you want God or not? 
And I, on that final day, I would like to sit at the table with great men and women of God that didn't allow the critics to pull them down. I want to be able to sit across from Charles Finney, Jonathan Edwards. I want to be with Paul. I want to be with Peter. I want to look at these guys straight in the eyes. I don't want Peter to look at me and say, Steve, we were watching. And the anointing was so powerful. We would have given anything to have the opportunity you had. How come you bellied up? How come you, you ducked as soon as criticism came and you left? And you went off and did something different. How come you didn't stand? I don't want to hear that in heaven, friend. I want them to look at me and go, wow, that's awesome. You really, you really went with it, man. You ran with the fire. So be one of those, friends. We just want to warn you ahead of time. When the criticism comes, just let it float right on by. I think it was Abraham Lincoln when he was asked about how he handles criticism. He says, I don't have time for it. He said, I'm too busy running a country. You know? And he said, I don't read it. I don't mess with it. And I don't either, friend. A lot of the stuff that comes, people ask me, did you hear? Did you do? You know, someone told me the other day that there's a preacher calling me a false prophet across the nation's airwaves. And, and uh, did you hear about that? No. I ain't got time for that, friend. There's 250 million people in America, and most of them don't know God. So you don't have time for the others, friend. I asked Dave Wilkerson one time, I said, what do you do about all the critics in New York? There's people that walk in outside his church. Barb Macker, he, his secretary, shared this with me. They, they march outside of Times Square Church with signs that say his, his meetings inside are cult meetings. It's a cult. And, and there's other pastors that hate him. There's people in the community that hate him. Other Christian leaders that just despise him. And I said, what do you do about folks like that? He said, Steve, there's nine million people in New York City that don't know God. I'm not going to spend my time with them, these other folks that are constantly criticizing. I've got to spend my time with the nine million people out there that don't know God. So concentrate on what Jesus concentrated on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'd like to give you a review. How many were here on Wednesday night? How many were here on Thursday night? How many are not here on Thursday night? Raise your hand high. That's what I thought. <laughs> Just review over the last several nights. This week's revival services began with a powerful intercessory prayer meeting on Tuesday night. On Tuesday night, hundreds of soldiers gathered together in this building to engage in intense spiritual warfare. And the results so far have been phenomenal. I say so far because the revival week is not over yet. Last Wednesday night, I spoke on true conversion. I spent time reliving Paul's conversion from Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 22. And I shared with you several points about true conversion. I've also preached in this revival, friend, about counterfeit conversion. I am concerned for America, friends, because a lot of people think they're saved and they're not. They think they're going to heaven, and they're not. They're not. Biblically, they're not. L their life depicts that they're not. You can read them. You can tell that they're not going to heaven. They don't love God. They're not going after his, his appearing. They're not awaiting the bridegroom. They're, they're, you can, it's obvious that they're not living for God, but they think they're saved. Someone has told them that they're going to heaven. And I shared this with you on Wednesday. When Jesus Christ gets a hold of your life, Everything changes. Everything changes, friend. And when your life, if you tell me that you're a Christian, that you got saved at the Brownsville Revival, then I want to see a change in you. One of the reasons I love Patrick and I love Sandy and I love the folks that come to this revival, not everyone that can come has been saved. There's been 70,000 people saved. But they come all the time. They keep filtering through here. A lot of them are saved from outside Florida. 
But a lot of the folks that have been saved in the community, they'll come through the revival. They'll let us know things are still going well. It's going great. God's healed my family. I'm still off drugs. And I'll never forget a young man from Mississippi who was a, a doctor in Mississippi came forward. He was sitting right where you are, ma'am. He came forward for prayer, and he was hooked on Dilatas. Dilatas is a derivative of morphine. It's a serious narcotic, and he would pump those things in his vein. It's a class A narcotic, and he would steal them from the hospitals. He was physically addicted for years on that, and he came forward for prayer, gave his life to God in this revival, was prayed for, hit the ground under the power of God. And if you know anything about drug addiction, you'll appreciate this. He got up. And this is a man that was so addicted to Dilatas, if he didn't have a Dilata, it's morphine, he would shake, he would tremble, he would sweat. He, I mean, he could not make it through the day. He left out of this building totally free, totally set free. He came back. He came back six months, six months later. And when I saw him, he was like a new man. He just, he came up to me and said, haven't touched it. And I said, well, where are you working now? Same place. I said, are you telling me you're working around the refrigerator that has the Class A narcotic? He goes, yeah. How long were you addicted? Seven years. And you can work around the Class A narcotics. You can inject other people with that narcotic, and you're not touched. It doesn't bother you. He said, no, I've been delivered, man. I've been delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. Friend. I'm telling you tonight, when Jesus Christ gets a hold of your life, everything changes. Everything changes. So if you haven't had a change, then I question your salvation. If you haven't changed, the, 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 the persecutor of the Christians, Saul of Tarsus, was on his way to Damascus to, to hurt people. And he was hit by the power of God, gave his life to Christ. And after that, friend, nothing was the same. And I preached on that Wednesday night. That's true conversion. Shared several points with you. Another point was that when you have a true encounter with God, His glory, His presence outshines everything else in your life. I love talking to the youth in this revival because they were heading one direction, then they get saved, Richard. Then they come up to you. One came up to me tonight and said, pray for me, Brother Steve. I was going to do this, but now I'm going to the Bible school. And it's just like this light is shining all around them. It's awesome. And others who are, 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 are in training to be a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer in some major university in this area, they come up to me and rather than pray for me about my studies, pray for me about this, they come up to me and they say, Steve, I have the opportunity of a lifetime this coming Monday morning to share with my class what Jesus Christ has done for me. Pray for me, Brother Steve. Their whole life has changed, friend. Sure, they're going to be a great doctor. They're going to be a great lawyer. But friend, that's not your calling. That's a way to live. That's about, your calling are the people that are around you. That's your mission field. And so, friend, he will shine a light. That light that shone on Paul that day that blinded his eyes. I'll never forget on October 28, 1975, when the light of Christ came on me and dispelled the darkness. And that light has been shining on me ever since. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He'll change your direction, friend. The last thing I shared was when you have a true conversion experience, you will become obedient to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Obedient to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Evan Roberts said, you want revival in your church? You better be willing to be obedient to the spontaneity of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to me, everybody. In just a few minutes, I'm going to give an altar call in this place. When I give this altar call, obedience is the only answer for you. That means if the Holy Ghost is speaking to you about pornography, if the Holy Ghost is speaking to you about sin in your life, if the Holy Ghost is dealing with you about areas of your life that you haven't given to God, if the Holy Ghost, if you're a Mormon, you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're a Muslim, you're a Buddhist, you're a New Ager, you're in the Eastern religions, and you're in this place, and you feel the presence of God, and the altar call is giving, and you know you're supposed to come down here. The only way your life is going to change is if you obey the wooing of the Holy Spirit, and you come down to the altar, and you give your life to Christ. It ain't going to happen in your seat. Paul was led away, friend. 
He was led away. He was blinded for three days. He said when he was hit by the power, he said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Obedience. And he never turned back. You obey the Lord tonight, friend. You want your life to change, and that's true conversion. That is true conversion. Well, last night I spoke on Acts chapter 3. I'm skipping Halloween right now. I spoke about the lame man at the gate beautiful. And I shared just a couple points with you, those of you that were in the meeting last night. Number one was this, this man was at the gate beautiful, he's at the gate of the temple. Number one was this, that religion will leave you lame at the gate. This man was crippled. This man was crippled and that is a type of sin. The man's crippled, his crippled condition is the same as many of you in this room. You are crippled in sin. You hobble around in life. You can't walk straight. Your head is into the dirt. You can't live a godly life because you're crippled in sin. And what you've tried to do is you've gone to religion. You've gone to Sunday school. You've gone to churches. You've gone to cantatas. You've done this and you've done that. Tried to fulfill this religious obligation, trying to get right with God. God, through all these outward things, but nothing's happened, friend, because religion will leave you lame at the gate. Are you against Sunday school? Don't you misquote me. I'm not against Sunday school. I'm not against church. I love church. My family are members of this church. We love this church. We love church. We believe in it. Am I against cantatas? No, sir. But all of that stuff in America has become icons, idols. And people, you talk to them, they'll sin all the week long. And come Sunday morning, they will teach in our Sunday schools. I had a young man saved right where you're at, brother, right where you're sitting, right there. A young man saved, I began to pray for him. And he said, Steve, I am a local Sunday school teacher. And it was a large church in this city. And he said, I teach the young adults and he said, Steve, I am a pornographer, an adulterer. And he started naming out these sins. And he's teaching the word. Unashamedly, friend. Every Sunday, rhythmic. Been doing it for years. I know how, friend. I'm telling you, religion will leave you lame at the gate. It'll leave you lame, friend. It won't change you. I've said it a thousand times, you can go to hell with baptismal waters all over your face. You can go to hell and be the, the pastor of the largest church in the city. You can go to hell and have a certificate of ordination from the assemblies of God hanging behind your desk, friend, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know the Lord. That's what will happen with religion. This man that was lame at the gate, the religious people walk by him all day long. You know what they do? They're tossing a quarter. They're tossing a nickel. That's about as good as you're going to get from religion, friend. Just a quick fix. Ain't nothing else going to happen for you, friend. Then I shared last night also, this is for a lot of you in this room, so listen up, that you must not, if you want something from God tonight, you must not be too proud to ask for help. This man was begging alms out there. He was asking for help. And some of you in this room, your life is in shambles, but you're too proud to ask for help. You're scared what other people are going to think about you. You're so prideful, you're a stench in God's nostrils. Who do you think you are, friend? Why don't you humble yourself under the, the mighty hand of God? When this altar call is given, come down here and say, I'm a sinner. I need God to save my soul. It doesn't matter what your wife thinks. It doesn't matter what your husband thinks. It doesn't matter what your girlfriend or boyfriend thinks. What does God think about your life, friend? Take a good look at that. You come down here. And I'm telling I'm talking to somebody at home right now. You're sitting in your prideful lazy boy. You're sitting in your couch. You're listening to this preacher preach, and pride has just pricked your heart. You know this is an area that you've got to deal with. Sir, 
You're nothing but a snot. That's what you are. That's what you are. And the Bible says God resists you. Who do you think you are? So you got a house, you got a car, you got a job, you provided for the family. Don't you ever forget, sir, God gave you the mouth to talk, he gave you the feet to walk, he gave you the hands to work, he gave you the ability to do everything you're doing. I'm going to tell you, the man I'm talking to you, I'm going to tell you what you just got finished doing today. You just got finished working in your garden. And I want to tell you something about your garden. That doesn't make any difference to me if you have a hundred varieties of flowers out there growing. I want you to know something. Jesus Christ created every one of them. And when you get that blue ribbon, when people walk by your house and they say, my, my, Fred, what a beautiful garden. My, my, Jim, what a gorgeous place you have here. Don't forget the one who put the soil down there. Don't forget the one who created every color of the rainbow. Don't forget him. That's pride, sir. You better start learning how to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But pride, friend, you better not be too proud tonight to ask for help. Is anybody listening? I hope so, friend. I'm tired, but I'm not going to stop. People ask us about this revival. Do we get tired? Worn to a frazzle, friend. I'm talking about it. It ain't, it ain't funny. I've been so dead. I have been so dead. As a matter of fact, one night in this revival, I was so exhausted, so exhausted that I was crying my eyes. I've never been that tired to where tears were just gushing out of me. My body had just given up, just quit. Because you go night after night after night, week after week after week, month after month after month, and now it's turning into years after years after years, giving and giving and giving and giving. Then I think about Jesus. What he did for us. I'm going, God, I haven't touched anything. We haven't come close. Well, let's move on. Thursday night. I want you to turn with me once again. to Matthew. The Lord told me today that he has, there's some unfinished business that needs to be taken care of. And if you want to title this message, you can title it Aftershock. But he told me there's some unfinished business and he's not releasing me until we take care of this, friend. So tonight you listen up. Matthew 27. This is the story of the crucifixion. I'm not going to read from verse 33 as I did the other night. I'm going to start at verse 47. Jesus had just screamed out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those, verse 47, who were standing there when they heard it began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, and he put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, verse 51, look at this, friend. The Bible says that the people sat down and watched the crucifixion. And I shared with you on Halloween night that there was all kinds of people at the crucifixion. I believe there were passers-by, people like you and I, that were on their way to the market to buy a loaf of bread. And they saw these forms hanging from those trees. And they worked their way up to that hill called Calvary just to see what was going on. And I believe some of them got close. It wasn't just a centurion. It wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't just a few of the priestly leaders. There was a host of folks hanging around that day. And they heard a lot of stuff go on, friend. They heard a lot. And I'm going to share with you just a couple of the things that they heard. But listen to this. 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
and the earth shook. I want you to say that with me. And the earth shook. I don't care what your translation says, friend. I want you to say it with me here. And the earth shook. Say it again. And the earth shook. You know what that means? The earth shook. <laughs> Cut it up any way you want to, friend. Let me ask the theologian on board. Is that what it meant? Is that what it meant? Thank you, Michael Brown. <laughs> But friend, you can slide right by those few words and not even think about it. But here's these folks watching this crucifixion, watching just another man die. Something's going on here. Something's happening, friend. And the earth shook. And the rocks were split open. And the tombs were opened. And many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion, verse 54, and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened. And they said, truly, this was the Son of God. Now I want to tell you what I believe is happening in a lot of lives here. And we're going to do it again tonight, folks, because God has not released me from this. I want you to dim the lights. If there's one thing that's fine right there, there's one thing I've learned, friend, and that is obey the Lord. It's to obey the Lord. Everything was fine up to this point. People were watching. They had seen some stuff. I shared with you on, on Halloween night that one of the things that they saw at the crucifixion was blood. Nothing attracts the attention of people like blood. Tonight, all over America, there will be car accidents. And when those car accidents take place, cars will slow down next to them. And the people, they're not that concerned about the automobiles. You know what they're looking for? Blood. And the next day, if the authorities were not successful in cleaning up the highways, people will drive by, and you know what they'll see? They might see shattered glass. They might see a fender or two. But what they'll see, what they're really looking for is, honey, what is that over there on that road? What is that? It looks like blood. That's one of the things they saw, friend, on Calvary. They saw blood, and they saw lots of it, friend. But I'm telling you tonight, the blood on Calvary wasn't just the blood of any man. It was precious blood. The blood on Calvary was the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was the blood. It was the blood. The blood of my Jesus. It was the blood of my Jesus. It was the blood of my Jesus that takes away the sin of the world. Friend, they saw it, but they didn't know what was going on. He said it himself. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Trip, 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 trip. That's for you, Patrick. That's for you, Sandy. That blood was for you. He saw you 2,000 years ago. He saw you, Sandy. He saw you drunk in New Orleans. And he said, Father, forgive her. She knows not what she does. Her heart is deceitfully wicked. But Father, I know that Sandy's coming home. I know she's going to get saved. I know, I know she is. They saw blood and they saw lots of it. What did they hear? They heard a lot of stuff, friend. They heard the screaming of the thieves. The thieves were being crucified alongside Jesus. Not a whole lot is said about it, friend, but crucifixion is an agonizing death. These guys were cursing. I can guarantee you. They were cursing Jesus. We know about that. But I promise you, they were spitting. They were spitting at the guards. They were cursing people standing around. Friend, 
That's what the people heard. They heard a lot of cursing going on. And they also heard another thing, friend. I'm taking you to the crucifixion. You need to hear this. They also heard this. They heard a lot of second and third hand comments. They heard a lot of people talking. See, wherever there's a crowd, Jesus was up there. He was at the top. All eyes were focused on him, and he would say things like this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He would say, I thirst. John, your mom, mom, your son. People that were close to Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. But as the crowd went back, the further you went back in the crowd, the more muffled the conversation became. And you would hear people saying, what did he say? I don't know what, he, he said something about Moses. He said something about, what did he say about sin? He said our sins are forgiven. That's what people heard, friend. They heard stuff floating through the crowd, all kinds of comments. It reminds me of revival. Yeah. It reminds me of revival. When you're in the epicenter, when you're right here in the middle of it, watching everything go on, you know what's going on, friend. But you get out there miles away, and it's second, fourth, fifth generation. No one knows what's going on. And something that was holy here, by the time it gets to Nebraska, through three or four heathens, they turn something that was holy, and they call it an abomination. But it was sacred here. God moved mightily, but they take it out of context. And they spread it across the airwaves and destroy something that God was doing. Well, you can't destroy what God's doing. It's impossible. But they twist it, friend. And that's what these people heard also. They heard the words of Jesus. And I'm not going to go through them tonight, friend. As a matter of fact... What shook this crowd, friend? What shook this crowd that was standing around the cross was when Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then something happened that's happening in many of your lives. And some of them, they'd already seen the, the, they had already seen the, the sky growing darker. But when Jesus died, friend, the Bible says darkness spread throughout the land. Am I telling the truth, Mike? Was there darkness all around? There was darkness all around, friend. It got dark. And I wanted you to know something, friend. It was broad daylight. It was daytime. Those of you that stood in line today, it would be like at high noon. Put your hand in front of your face and you couldn't see it. You would forget everything else that was going around your life instantly. It wouldn't matter to you what was going on at home. It wouldn't matter to you what the next person was thinking. You'd be going, oh my God. And someone would say, it's an eclipse. And another person would say, no, that's impossible. It's not an eclipse. I know. I'm a scientist. It's not an eclipse. This is a supernatural act of God. And suddenly, you know what you would find? People would be on their knees. Suddenly, fear would grip the land. And that's exactly what took place at the crucifixion when the darkness came and the darkness fell upon the earth. And I want that right now, gentlemen. Turn the lights down. This is what they experienced. And those that were watching the crucifixion suddenly heard this. They heard this. And they realized something was going wrong. This is not just a normal crucifixion. There's something going on here that's beyond anything we've ever seen. What is going on on this hill called Calvary? Who is that man? Who is that man that has the inscription, here is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Surely this was the Son of God. up a little bit. The Bible says every one of them left Mount Calvary beating their breast. That is a sign of grief and remorse. 
remorse and guilt. You read it in the word, friend. That is a sign of conviction. Something went wrong. And where one minute they may have been mocking, one minute they may have been cursing, one minute they may have been laughing, the next minute they're going, oh my God, what have we done? Honey, look at that rock. Hold on to me, babe. Who is he? Surely he's the son of God. It wasn't dark for 30 minutes. It wasn't dark for 45 minutes. It wasn't dark for an hour. For three hours, darkness came over the land. For three hours, the convicting power of God fell like a, a blanket over the people, friend. They realized this was not an ordinary crucifixion. Something's going on. Something occurred to me a while ago as these people began to beat their breasts. I can imagine some of the people walking away from that crucifixion saying this. I remember him talking to us about this. I remember one day I was in Jerusalem and he was talking about being lifted up. I remember something about this. I remember he said that he was going to die and three days later he was going to rise. I remember him talking about this and you want to know what that does to you? It causes conviction to go even deeper. The word, friend, will pierce through you like a knife. It's a two-edged sword and it pierces these people and they left out under conviction like many of you in this room. You live under conviction. You live under conviction. To be convicted is to be guilty. You know there's sin in your life. You know you've done something wrong. You are sitting there beating your breast. You know you've been had. God has got a hold of you. That's what happened to these people. And whoa, what a 40 days that must have been. 40 days. 40 days, friend went by before the true light shone again. I don't know what it was like around the dinner tables for 40 days in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Maybe it was like this, friend. Maybe for the first several days, Pastor, things were okay. You know, they, they'd sort of, you know, they just, you know how people shrug stuff off? And then, and then, Maybe one of the men that was standing there, you know, the earthquake's over. Anybody listening? The earthquake's over. Like that sudden disaster in your life where you fell under conviction, it's over. The earthquake's over, so things are sort of back to normal. There's still a few rocks that are split wide open. You've made adjustments, but you're doing all right, and you're walking down the road one day, and somebody's talking at the marketplace, and it's someone else that was at that, that hill called Calvary. And they're, they're, they're recreating the whole incident of how the earth shook underneath them and the rocks split open and how the earth split right underneath them. They had to jump to one side and one man telling how he almost lost his child in a hole that formed underneath her feet. And you're standing there listening to that. You went to buy some tomatoes, but you're listening to that. And then you realize again, Two weeks go by, three weeks go by, a month goes by, and then one day, friend, you're walking down the road and you see a crowd. I'm calling this aftershock because this is what many of you are experiencing, and friend, I want to tell you, earthquakes are a warning. Can I say that again? Earthquakes are a warning. They are a warning. I am convinced, you ask any insurance agents under, that's in this room tonight, they're called an act of God. They are a warning to mankind. In the last days, they'll be in divers places, earthquakes. They are a warning. They are a sign. But when earthquakes take place, friend, you look at any of the earthquakes that have taken place throughout history, everything changes. 
It doesn't matter where you eat lunch that day, friend. You could care less about lunch. Your car is upside down in a ditch. The road that you're going to travel on just collapsed, and 27 people were killed. Everything changes. You were concerned about a business meeting you were going to go to, and now suddenly you're concerned about your family. And you rush over to the school to see if your child is alive, and you arrive there, and windows are busted, and columns are down, but thank God no one was killed. But it's a warning. And you know what everyone's talking about during an earthquake? Aftershocks. Get out of the building. There could be an aftershock. Something else could happen, and I'm speaking to you spiritually, friend. An aftershock is a warning, and I'm letting you know here, the big one's coming. There's a big one coming, friend, and these people that were at the crucifixion, they were shaken to the point they were beating their breasts. But then 40 days went by, and here we are. We're walking on the way to Jerusalem, and we're at the marketplace, and there's a man named Peter. He had just been filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's preaching. He's preaching the Word. Oh, friend, don't you feel it? And you want to know what this is? This is an aftershock. He stands up there and play it again, brother. Peter stands up there and he points out at the people. And he said, men and women of Israel, this man that God raised up and proved him through signs and wonders and miracles, he is the one that you crucified. You killed him. You killed him, and suddenly this starts back up again. Dear God, no, again. And he says, you are the one. No one, friend, was exempt that day that walked by Peter's sermon. You are the one. You killed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You killed the Messiah. You crucified him on Calvary, not the other people that committed the crime. You're the one that committed the crime. Your sins put him on that cross. And I could see the people standing there. And they remember back, and I had certain theologians that some of the people that saw the crucifixion got saved on the day of Pentecost. I am certain of that, friend. And I could see them on that day falling on their face before Peter, saying, oh my God, what must we do? What do we do? I can't live like this anymore. For 40 days I've been under conviction. For 40 days I have felt this pain. For 40 days I have felt this grief. What must I do? And Peter says, repent. Repent. Ask Jesus to wash your sins away. Repent. Repent. Friend, I'm warning you, man. God told me there's some unfinished business. Some of you, you want to see some earthquakes, so do you, that are still having a problem with these earthquake things? Look in the Word. Look at the judgment that came through earthquakes. Read the book of Acts. Remember Paul when he was in prison? What did God send? What was the jailer doing? Sleeping. What aroused him? An earthquake. Think about that, friend. An earthquake aroused him from his sleep. And I'm looking at that going, God, there's such a spiritual parallel to this. You're trying to get our attention. You're trying to show us. And the only way you can show some of us is to shake the very foundation of our lives. And for many of you in this room, friend, God's been doing the very thing. He has taken some of your lives and he's shaken the very foundation. Your marriage has fallen apart. You're financially bankrupt. He's allowed all that stuff to come upon you. Why? So you could realize who he is and who you are.
You may say, well, I'm just going through a bad year. Friend, God's bigger than that. God can have his hand upon you and be blessing you. And if he sees you going astray, friend, he can lift his hand from you. I've watched it happen. And you call it a bad year? I call it the hand of God off your life. His hand of blessing, he's left you, friend. And you're saying, well, things will just come around on their own. No, friend. Check the earthquake out underneath you. That's why everything's shaking all around you. What you need to do is repent. You need to fall on your face before God. You need to scream out as a centurion, and the rest of them screamed out that day, surely this is the Son of God. Some of you, God has been trying to get a hold of you for the longest time. Some of you go from disaster to disaster. Disaster to disaster. Do you hear these, Richard? It's amazing, man. People come up to me and their story, their stories sound like something out of a science fiction novel or something. I mean, their story is so wild. And I go, how old are you? And they go, 18. And that's happened to you and they go, yeah, most of that's happened in the last two years. And I look at them, I go, sis, hello. Hello. Who do you think's trying to get a hold of you, sis? You're shipwrecked. Disaster all around you. You're in a spiritual famine like nobody's business. You're dying. The vultures are circling over your head. You're a goner. And you're still giving out lame excuses? You're still reaching for some lame, idiotic excuse? Why don't you realize it, sis? You're away from God. That's the bottom line. You've slipped away from God's hand. Friend, God's been trying to get a hold of many of you. I can feel the conviction in this place right now. I can feel it. This is an aftershock for some of you. That's exactly what this is. An aftershock is another wave of the convicting power of God. He's trying to get a hold of you, man. He's got a plan for your life. He wants to take you somewhere. And the only thing that gets a hold of some of you is disasters in your own life. It's the only thing that happens to get a hold of you. you got, God's got to send some type of major catastrophe in your life. I'm warning you tonight, friend. The Spirit of the Lord will not always deal with you. Did anyone hear that? The Spirit of the Lord is not always going to deal with you. The Bible says His Spirit will not always contend with you. Some of you that are dealing with sins that God's been dealing with you for years, who do you think you are and who do you think He is? He's the one that split the, the veil of the temple. I believe that was what, almost 10 inches thick? Is that correct? The veil of the temple, 10 inches thick, ripped it from the top to the bottom. God Almighty splits the rocks, opens the earth, swallows people up anytime he wants to. Been trying to get a hold of you. I'm talking about mercy, friend. It's been nothing but mercy. Nothing but mercy. But I got a feeling in America, and those of you visiting from other countries, We've been using up the Lord's patience. And he ain't going to come back with no, he's not coming back for some stained, stained garmented bride, some, some, some whipped around bride, some, some bride that's got blood stains all over her garment. He's coming back for a pure, holy bride, friend. And he's doing some work. He's trying to get a hold of you, religious person. I want everyone to stand. Those of you with the chairs, move them to the left and the right. No one else leave the building. If you're thinking about going to the bathroom, I just warn you, warn you ahead of time, this, there's speakers in all the bathrooms. <laughs> Some of you that are under conviction right now, you know what you do? You turn to your wife, you turn to your neighbor and say, listen, I got to go to the potty. 
I got to go to the bathroom. That's the devil all over you, buddy. How come you got to suddenly go to the bathroom during the altar call? I'm just like, go on, go to the bathroom. There's a speaker in there. You can be one miserable puppy in there, buddy. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to get right with God. I want charity to come. When I told you just a few minutes ago that the big one is coming, friend, these shocks, these aftershocks, I liken those to waves of conviction that comes over your life over and over and over again. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you turn on the television, you'll see John Hagee up there preaching the Word of God. And he'll say something that bothers you. It'll convict your heart and bother you. And you'll flip the channel. That was a shock wave, wasn't it? That was an aftershock. God's trying to get a hold of you. But then things get calm again. Things get calm. A few days later, something else happens. Another shock wave shoots through. Another rumbling underneath your feet. You're like the jailer, one minute sleeping, the next minute going, oh my God, my life is falling apart all around me. Pulls out a sword ready to kill himself. But thank God there was a man of God there that said, do yourself no harm. God's mercifully trying to get a hold of you, friend. I want a little more lights in this room to make sure the folks in the balcony don't step on each other when they walk. Turn them up just a little bit. Look at me, everybody. Every one of you in this room that Jesus Christ has been trying to get a hold of your life. Every one of you in this room that have don't know the Lord, you know you don't know God. You know you don't know God. You know all about him, but you don't know him. I'm going to say that again, friend, because some of you are so thick-skulled. You know all about him, but you don't know him. He's not your best friend. You don't wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart. You don't spend the day singing his praises. You don't think about him during the day. You don't go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart. Friend, if that's not you, I don't care if you're Pentecostal, Episcopalian, Baptist, Methodist, it makes no difference. There ain't a domination in heaven. Not one of those are found in heaven. The only membership card in heaven is blood red, friend. Blood red. It's got your name and you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Some of you know all about him, but you don't know him. You don't know him. This altar calls for you. Those of you in this room that are dirty, rotten sinners, you know what that means? That means you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Had a man confess that to me one night here in this revival, so I'm just going to use it. He said, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. You know what he was? A dirty, rotten sinner, friend. You know what he got? Salvation. You want to know why? Because he didn't come forward and stand in front of us here and go, I've just got a few things, you know, that i got to deal with. No, friend. There was sin in his life. And it ain't that small or this big. If it's sin, it's sin, friend. If you're into pornography, it makes no difference, friend. If you, if you get excited just, just looking at a Playboy magazine or you're down at the triple, quadruple, X-rated th theaters, you're into pornography, friend. You're lusting. You're destroying your body. And something else that you're doing, friend, that you never think about, you are promoting an industry that is damning this nation. Every time you buy a video, Every time you put a quarter in a slot, every time you buy a magazine, some little girl is being snatched off the streets of New York and being put into some little, some little dirty house. And they're stripping that little eight-year-old girl naked and they're taking pictures of her. Why? 
Well, I only read Playboy. Friend, it's all connected. It's all connected. You have put your money into that vein, into that filthy river. Will I be held accountable for that? Afraid so, bub. Afraid so. Now, I've often thought what hell would be like. I thought, I wonder what it would be like to have been the father of one of the little children that was snatched off the streets of St. Louis and was forced into pornography for years and years, a little eight-year-old child, and the father spent years trying to find his child. It happens every day in America. Years trying to find little Sheila. And then they finally find her, her body mutilated, her corpse, and then they find her pictures in triple X-rated films. What it would be like, friend, I wonder if hell might be something like this on that day when you're judged for you have to face that little girl's father. If you were one of those that bought that video, if you're one of those that bought that film, maybe the Lord should just let that man loose on you for a little while before casting you into eternal flames. After building up wrath for years, how anybody can be so corrupt, but I'm speaking to some people in this room, you are that corrupt. You are that corrupt. And God wants to wash you as white as snow. He wants to forgive you tonight. He wants to be merciful to you tonight. That hit a lot of folks in this room. Some of you really got hit just then. I want to tell you, it's good. That's like an earthquake in your life. You need to be shaken up. Others of you have never known the Lord. You're from some Eastern religion or some other religion you've never known God. Let me tell you, friend. You can be a reader of tarot cards. You can have a crystal ball at home. You can study the stars with telescopes. I want to tell you something. My God, the one who's here at these altars, made the paper that your tarot cards are made of. My God made the crystal ball, made the crystal that your crystal ball is made of. My God made the stars that you're looking at through the telescope. You're worshiping the wrong thing, friend. That's like bowing down to a butterfly, not down to the one who made the butterfly. What are you doing worshiping strange gods? It's God made of wood, God made of metal, God made of plastic. Worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come bow down to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's here tonight. He is in this room, friend, and he's here to forgive you. He is here to forgive you. Now, here's what we're going to do. Everyone in this room that has sin in their life, every one of you, that you've had thoughts of adultery, perhaps, boy, that hit some folks just then like an arrow. Every one of you that you know there's sin between you and God, when I give this altar call, you need to come quickly to this altar. Don't come until charity begins to sing. Every one of you that have never known the Lord, you're going to come as quickly as you can. Every one of you that are backslid, you live between two worlds. You got one hand in the hand of the devil, the other hand in the hand of God. Friend, God ain't got your hand. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. You have told the Lord, I will serve the devil. If you think he's got a hold of your hand, friend, you're wrong. Jesus said, any man putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is not fit for the kingdom of heaven, friend. What you need to do is go after God and God alone. Backslider, quit turning around. You go towards Jesus tonight. Let go of the hand of the devil. Take hold of the hand of God tonight. This is your night. When I give this altar call, I want to tell you, friend, you better come quickly. You better come quickly. The reason I felt this, I believe this morning, when the Lord said, I have some unfinished business. I have some unfinished business. And I studied two and three other texts of Scripture for tonight. And the Lord kept saying, Steve, I have unfinished business. I was studying in the book of Isaiah, and the Lord was saying, Steve, I have unfinished business. And I even came tonight with three sermons, three different sermons that the Lord's given me. 
just over the last few days. Three fresh sermons, three, three things to share. And the Lord kept saying, I have unfinished business. I have unfinished business. And they came up to me and said, what's the title of your sermon tonight? And I turned to the man, I said, I don't know. I don't know. And the Lord, all the way through the song service, was saying, I have unfinished business. I have unfinished business. I have unfinished business. And he kept speaking to me about Halloween night. And then right before I got out, what did I tell you, Charlie? I said, go tell the man the name of the sermon tonight is Aftershock. But God has got some unfinished business. He's trying to get a hold of you again. Again. Another wave of conviction. Tonight you better say, what must I do? The Lord is saying to you, repent. That is what you're going to do tonight. Repentance is coming down to this altar and changing, turning around. Before charity sings, you might be saying to me tonight, well, I don't want to go down to that altar. Why do I have to go to the altar? Friend, why not? What's your problem? Sounds to me like pride. That's one of the greatest sins in the Bible. One of the greatest sins in the Bible is pride. You're thinking about this other stuff in your life, but pride has got you gripped and shackled to that pew. You're chained to that pew because of pride, wondering what people are going to think. Who cares? Who cares what people think? I don't care what people think about me no more. If I shake, I shake. If I fall, I fall. If I cry my eyes in repentance, I cry my eyes in repentance. My wife, I love my wife dearly. She loves me, but I can't take her to heaven. She can't take me to heaven. It's one-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. I'm going because I got right with God. She's going because she got right with God. We maintain a relationship or not. She maintains her relationship or not. It's up to me. It's up to her. I can't save her. She can't save me. So it doesn't matter if Jerry comes down to this altar one night and cries her eyes out. That's wonderful. I come up to her and I hug her and say, honey, I love you, baby. Hallelujah. I'm not going, well, what was going on in your life, man? There's been times I have wept my eyes out in this revival meeting about the conviction of the Holy Ghost. When I was preaching, God spoke to my heart about stuff. How many know what I'm talking about? I hope so, because there ain't nobody in here that's pure as snow. And you cry your eyes out, and you get right with God right there and say, Jesus, get every tinge of dirt out of me. Anything that's there. Robert Murray McShane, in back in the 1840s, when people would come up to him and praise him for a good message. He was a great Scottish preacher. And they'd pat him on the back for his great messages. He would wail. He would cry out to God. And he would say, forgive me, Father, for receiving a tinge of your glory. Because somebody said, good message, Pastor. And he received it. And pride welled up. And he was the one that said, it is even possible to be guilty of being a prideful man because you wanted to be known as a holy man. He said it is possible to go after holiness and be spotless because you want people to see you like that. And pride can well up inside of you. Think about that, friend. They called him Holy McShane. They said to be with him was to be with Christ. And he even confessed that to God, that there was pride in his heart at times because he was so holy. Think about that. Dear God, get right with him tonight, friend. Get right with the Lord tonight. As soon as charity begins to sing, you're not to stay in your pew if there's sin in your heart. You're not to stay in the balcony, and you're not to stay at home. You're going to get from that lazy boy and get on your face. You're going to fall from that couch and get on that rug before God. And those of you in this room, if sin is in your life, you better get right with God while this aftershock is taking place in your life. This is the time right now. I want you to come right now. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on right now. I need Jesus. Hurry. Hurry, sing it out, Charity. Turn her up. Come on. 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 I face the power of sin on my own. I do not know of a place I could go. Come on. Come on. Where I can find a way to heal my own. What are you waiting on, Brad? He saw the light could come into his presence. 
sing it, Jerry. Lost in the curse of a lifetime of sin. Come on, the choir room. Come on. Lovely illusions, they never come true. I know where there's a place of mercy for you. He saw the girl could come and choose yeah. the Friend, don't you leave out of this building tonight under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost without getting it right. Don't you dare do that, friend. If you know God's trying to get a hold of you in this room, you need to get down here right now. Go, well, Brother Steve, there's so many people down there already. You're not down here. What does that have to do with anything? If God's convicted your heart, you're supposed to be down here. Find a place in the aisles and repent. I'm just going to do it at home. No, you're not, friend. You're going to do it here. It won't work at home. You'll go home. You'll feel like a, you'll feel like a traitor to God if you go home and talk to him there because he's trying to call you here. Come on. Come on. There's some folks here that have opened up the door to the devil because of some of the things that you've done and your family is reaping, your, your family is reaping the results of your sin. You know exactly who I'm talking about. You've opened up the door to the devil by some of the things that you've done and it's destroying your family. It is destroying your family. You can blame it on everything else. It ain't everything else, friend. It's called sin. It's called sin. America needs to repent. You need to repent tonight, sir. You need to repent tonight, ma'am. Get down here right now. Get down here right now. Yeah. Come on. Keep your heads down at the altar. Yields to that. A lot of times he doesn't really realize it, but he's opened the door to the devil even on his son. The devil comes and travels along that bloodline. And his son, the very damnable thing that that man hates so bad and wrestles with and harasses him and torments him for a lifetime by yielding to that thing, a lot of times he opens up the devil, the door to the devil on his own son, and his son has to wrestle with the same thing dad had to wrestle with. I've seen that so many times, friends. But I tell you, there's a remedy for it, and it's called the blood of Jesus. Yes. The blood of Jesus will cancel that thing 
and take it out of the way. And you'll find out a lot of times, men, when you get right with God, your whole family begins to brighten and yes, begins to come it does. around. That's the truth. Hallelujah. We're going to have Lyndall just sing a, a chorus, and we're going to still give you time to come. I'm going to close this altar call in about two minutes. If you know you're supposed to be down here, I want you to come right now. Come on. Come on. God bless you, sir. Come on. Search me, O oh God. Know my thoughts. God bless you, yes. God bless you. Nothing is hidden. Don't hold back, friend. Come on. From you. Come on. Come on. Lead me along the path of life that I may walk in truth. Come on. Bring me closer. You've got 30 seconds. If you're getting down here, get down here now. Come on. 30 seconds. Created me a clean. Come on. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Make of me, Lord. Come on. I want everyone at the altar to stand right now. I want you to stand. Normally I pray with the folks as you're bowed, but I want every one of you to stand and look at me. I want y'all to stand and look at me. We're going to have a prayer. It's going to be a prayer of repentance. I want you to look at me. Everyone, don't anyone move around. We're going to pray and ask Jesus Christ to forgive us, to wash our sins away. Some of you are here for the very first time and have never known the Lord. Others of you have known God for a long time, but there's sin in your life. Some of you are backslid. You've been backslid for years. Some of you have been convicted by the power of God tonight about something that's been going on that no one else has a clue. But tonight, the Holy Spirit has shown a light on that. And you felt the shaking underneath your life. How many of you tonight would admit that you felt the Lord just shaking your life tonight? Lift your hand high. You can put it down. That's why you're down here. First thing you need to do, friend, in your own spirit, you need to thank God. You need to thank God that you can feel him speaking to you. Thank God, man, that you can feel. As a matter of fact, I want us all to say that. Thank you, Jesus, that you spoke to me. Friend, that is so important. Because there's coming a time, friend, there's people out there on the streets tonight that will never again hear the Spirit of God. I believe that with all my heart. Theologians argue all day with me about that. We'll stand before God. I meet them on the streets. They're gone, friend. It's over. Their spirit has, they have, they have just, they're stoned over. Are they hopeless? Friend, I don't know. Only God can determine that. But I've met people, friend, 
that cannot hear the Spirit of God anymore. They're so far gone. Matter of fact, one man came to this meeting one time, sat right, right here. A man, he sat right over the room. He walked right in. I've known this man for 18 years. He stood right there. He is one of the biggest pornographers. I mean, the most ungodly man that I've ever met in my life. But he walks in this place. He walks in this place, dressed in a suit, sat down there, came to one of our meetings, sat down. I gave an altar call. He cried his eyes out at this altar, stands back up, goes back and does the same thing. Man has never changed for 18 years. I've known this guy. And I've asked him, I said, do you feel the presence of God? He goes, no. No. I said, do you want to change? He goes, honestly, no, I don't. I said, don't you care about hell? He goes, no, I just, the guy's gone, friend. He sits in churches, he hears the word, he's gone. He is so gone. But you'd look at him and you'd think he was a Prince Charlie, but the man is so in sin. And I haven't told a third of what he's involved in. He's gone. Can God save him? Only God knows. But those of you tonight that were pricked by the arrows of the Lord, he spoke to your heart. Thank God you feel his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now we're going to pray a prayer, and then Richard's going to come and share a couple things with you. We're going to pray. Yeah, go ahead. There's still just one last thing of unfinished business. I'm shaking on the inside, but I've got to say this. When God was ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham prayed, and because of Abraham's prayers, people were spared. Lot and his family were spared. And the Bible says when they delayed that the angel took their hands because the mercy of the Lord was upon them. And there's some people here, the only reason you're still here and God's still dealing with you has nothing to do with you, but somebody's been praying for you. That's it. If God dealt with you based on the way he should, you've been long gone. Now listen, just one last thing. This is an urgent thing from the Lord, otherwise the Lord would never have me get up and do this because Steve is so totally thorough, but God is just making it with an exclamation point. If you cannot look me in the eye and say, my heart is pure and my hands are clean, and I'm ready to stand before God. If you can't look me in the eye, how are you going to look God in the eye? One last opportunity right now without any delay from the balcony and everywhere else you are to get down here. If you cannot say out loud before God, my heart is pure and my hands are clean. Well, God's having mercy. One last moment. Nothing's being delayed. But if your heart is not pure and you know it and your hands are not clean, somebody's praying, God's still having mercy. Even if it's for one last person, get down here before the altar call is closed. Come on. Jesus. Come on, friend. This is called mercy. Those of you that have been to criminal court, I'm giving you a chance to come right here. Those of you that have stood before a judge, you know what mercy is. Mercy is you deserve 15 years and he gave you probation. That's what this is right here. Mercy is we deserve punishment and God saying, I love you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to forgive you tonight. But I want to tell you, there's coming a time you'll use up God's mercy. The loving Savior will one day be a severe judge. The one hand that stroked you will one day strike you. Come on. Several people responded just then, Mike. God bless you for your obedience. Here's what we're going to do. Look at me, everybody. We're going to pray a prayer and ask the Lord to wash our sins away, to forgive us. No matter what you've done, the very act that you're down here is showing God something. Now, you know what's going on inside of your heart. You know whether or not you're serious. You could be standing here praying this prayer with me, but inside going, I can't wait to go out and get a fifth of whiskey. You know what's going on inside your heart, but I got a feeling most of you are dead serious. You really want God to change your life. You want God to do a work. I want everyone in this room at this altar call, not in this room, this is just for those at the altar call, every one of you to pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Pray it out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for shaking my foundation. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving me alone. I ask you tonight 
to forgive me. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me, Jesus. I repent of my sins. I bow before you, asking your forgiveness. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. I give myself to you 100% from this moment on. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.